A senior investigator at National Human Genome Research Institute, Julie Segre, says we should lose the language of warfare as it does a disservice to all the bacteria that have co-evolved with us and are maintaining the health of our bodies. Rather than conducting indiscriminate slaughter, we should be thinking of these bugs as socializing the immune system and we become microbial wildlife managers. That's a great concept. It really is a great concept, being a wildlife manager of what's going on in here, of the thousands of species in there and creating an environment that's friendly to our probiotics. So let's talk a little about the immune system of the gut, where 70% of the immune system in the body resides. So understanding the, comp the puzzle of complex diseases, it arises from the action of our genes and environment, as I gave you the example with celiac disease. Where's the front line where most of this occurs? It's in the gut and the mucosal immune system. It's a critical line of defense. The mucosal immune system of the gut, of the lungs, of the mouth, there where the action takes place, where the bad guys are kept out. That's the goal here. Now remember, our mucosal immune system is designed to protect us from all of the threats that our ancestors were exposed to thousands of years ago. Not designed to protect us from benzene inhaled in the lungs. Not designed to protect us from bisphenol A. And so what you get is excessive inflammatory response to so many of the environmental toxins we're exposed to today. That's a whole nother topic. Dr. Roundtree will talk about that in much more detail in the next day or two. So the gut-associated lymphoid tissue is the resident immune system in the GI tract. It's the largest lymph organ in the body, producing 50 to 70 percent of the immune system. It's populated by T cells, B cells, plasma cells. It's the first line of defense to the majority of antigen exposure, including dietary molecules and infectious agents. We all know about secretory IgA, right? That's a first line of defense. It gets secreted out into the lumen of the intestines to grab onto any antigens and escort them right out with the bowel movement. And they are not allowed to get in. So if your patient has a low secretory IgA identified on a stool analysis, what might that suggest? That they're vulnerable to the potential antigens they're exposed to in their diet. Much more vulnerable because they have a low secretory IgA. More emphasis on building a healthier microbiome is one takeaway from that one biomarker, a low secretory IgA. Focus a little more on the microbiome for those people. The primary focus of GALT is twofold, determination of friend or foe, initiating and sustaining an appropriate immune response. So the components of GALT that are designed to protect us, dendritic cells, commensals, macrophages, pattern recognition receptors, neutrophils, toe-like receptors, regulatory T cells, aminoglobulins, intraepithelial lymphocytes, interleukins, cytokines, all of these different components to protect us from the potential toxins that our ancestors were exposed to. I keep repeating that because it's really important. Most people don't think about that. We don't have defense against the environmental toxins, against the flame retardants that are in the bedding that we sleep in that outgas a little flame retardant. We don't have defenses against that except to treat it like a bug, parasite, virus, mold, fungus, or bacteria. That's why so many of us are so inflamed all the time is the overload of toxins that we're being exposed to. So friend or foe, a response to a friend. This is a paper that Dr. Bojdani and I published in 2008 where, and this was on gluten, the gluten coming through a tight junction, a few molecules of gluten coming through. There's a little bit of deamidation that occurs, but the dendritic cells say, oh, this isn't much of a problem. Let's, let's just watch this producing a transforming growth factor beta and IL-10 and tolerogenic dendritic cells. And the result is nothing, nothing. Okay, it's fine. There's a controlled immune response to these dietary proteins. But if you have a foe coming in, if you cross the line of tolerance, the same gluten molecules coming in 
activate an entire immune response. The genes get activated, and the dendritic cell binds onto the genes, producing a mature dendritic cell. CD4 cells are produced, B cells are produced, IgG, IgM, IgA antibodies to the peptides of poorly digested wheat and transglutaminase get produced. Now you're off to the races with systemic pro-inflammatory cytokines and a further contribution towards the development of autoimmune diseases. It's all about tolerance. The same molecule, gluten, for some people is tolerated, for most it is not. And it's because of the overwhelming amount of toxins that we're exposed to in our world today. Many of us have heard about the hygiene theory, that our fanaticism about not getting dirty has really caused a problem and weakened our immune systems. Contact with old friends is greatly diminished in rich countries like the U.S., but increased on farms, in cow sheds, and through contact with pets. This is a great example. There's households that don't have a dishwasher, and w dishes are washed by hand. Children seven to eight years old have much lower incidences of allergies and allergy symptoms. Why? Because when you wash a fork by hand, sometimes there's a little crud left on the fork. Next time you take the fork out of the drawer, you get a little crud exposure, right? And it's enough to help your immune system say, well, I need to fight that one. It's like exercising a bicep. You're exercising the immune system in your gut with minor exposures. How did our ancestors live? They didn't have triclosan and dishwashing soap full of these antibacterials. And they had strong immune systems, right? They don't get allergies in villages in Africa. You know, they get many, they get some diseases, but they, they don't get the diseases of the Western society very much at all because they have strong immune systems. The inflammasome is when your immune system gets activated trying to protect you. The Italians call it inflammaging, and it's the overexpression of inflammation genes, immune response genes, and genes associated with the lysosomal system. So when you have a patient that's inflamed, and I would venture to say 90 plus percent of your patients have excess inflammation, that's why they're coming to you with their symptoms, when they're inflamed, a valid question is, where is the gasoline coming from that's being thrown on the fire? Where's the inflammation coming from? So the strongest predictor of disease progression is the extent of chronic systemic immune activation. What's activating the immune system trying to protect you? I keep saying that because we think an activated immune system is a problem. It's your protection against bugs, parasites, viruses, molds, fungus, and bacteria. It's your protection trying to protect you. Educating your patients on this one concept of reducing systemic inflammation as a primary component of addressing their presenting condition is paradigm shifting and empowers them to comply with your recommendations of functional testing and treatments. You give them a big picture view. We're going to find out where all this is coming from. So what about the nervous system, the enteric nervous system? In recent years, the interface between neuropsychiatry and gastroenterology has converged into a new discipline referred to as enteric neuroscience. What do we know about the enteric nervous system? Well, Dr. Michael Gershon from Princeton uh, was here in 2000 as um, one of the keynotes for our annual conference after his book came out, The Second Brain. And that information has progressed now to where a 2016 bestseller by Emeryn Meyer is the mind-gut connection. And you see all of the studies now coming out, how for every message from the, brain, uh, from the brain going down telling the gut what to do, there are nine messages from the gut going up telling the brain what to do. The ratio is nine to one. The enteric nervous system, or the second brain, has a hundred million neurons governing the function of the proximal and distal GI tract. An intrinsic network of nerve fibers and ganglia housed in the wall of the GI tract is supplied by ex extrinsic innervation. The ENS regulates and coordinates almost all aspects of intestinal function, including gut motility, the transport of fluid and electrolytes, the secretion of mucins, the production of cytokines, and the regulation of epithelial barrier function. The role of the enteric glial cells extended from that of simple nutritive support for enteric neurons to that of being pivotal participants in the regulation of inflammatory events in the gut. 
What do we know about the enteric nervous system? It's a component of the autonomic nervous system, but it functions independently of the central nervous system. It functions on its own. It's crucial for essential GI physiological functions, such as motility, fluid secretion, blood flow. It's organized in a complex structure that controls motility, blood flow, uptake of nutrients, secretion, and immune and inflammatory processes in the gut. And the gut microbiota modulates the function and the anatomy of the enteric nervous system. An example is Bifidobacteria animalis, BB12. There are many different strains, but BB12 has the effect of turning on the enteric nervous system to increase peristalsis, and it's an excellent protocol with constipation. That particular strain is excellent with constipation. The microbiota turning on the enteric nervous system. So it's, there's robust evidence that the gut microbiota regulates ENS anatomy function, modulates the enteric nervous system, an effect that may contribute to afferent signaling to the brain. The ENS acts as a highway transporting molecules and peptides from the gut to the brain. This paper came out just uh, uh, in August of this year, and I put it in here because it's like, what? What, what do we now know? Transneuronal propagation of pathologic alpha-synuclein from the gut to the brain, models of Parkinson's. When they take a, a mouse model, and if they inject alpha-synuclein, um, a misfolded alpha-synuclein into the gut, that mouse will develop Parkinson's. How do they develop Parkinson's? Parkinson-like symptoms. It's by that alpha-synuclein in the gut that was injected into the gut. It goes up neuron by neuron up the vagus nerve. So it goes from the enteric nervous system back into the spine, up the vagus nerve to the brain, has a magnetic pull to the substantia nigra in the brain, and the misfolded alpha-synuclein goes in there, creates the inflammation that eventually causes Parkinson's. When they do the same injection to animals, but they cut the vagus nerve, there's no development of Parkinson's in the animals. It's neuron by neuron. Ask any Parkinson patient, and 20 years ago, they had severe constipation, and they've had it their entire life. The vast majority of Parkinson's patients have had gut dysfunction because of dysbiosis for decades before the end-stage symptoms developed that the gut had a strong contribution to the entire mechanism in the development of Parkinson's. There's a number of papers that have come out now like that. Enteric glia play a major role in gut pathologies associated with barrier dysfunction. So what do we know about the enteric nervous system? It functions independently of the CNS. It controls motility, blood flow, uptake of nutrients, secretion and immune inflammatory processes in the gut. It regulates both inflammatory and anti-inflammatory events in the gut. It controls motility, blood flow, uptake of nutrients, secretion, and immune and inflammatory processes in the gut. It transports, transports misfolded proteins, neuron by neuron, up the vagus nerve to the brain, influenced directly by gut bacteria, an effect that may contribute to afferent signaling to the brain. So to treat the enteric nervous system, two things that I can think of. One is the microbiota of the gut, create more diversity of healthy microbiota in the gut. And for some people, mechanical care, chiropractic care, helps the enteric nervous system work so much better. And there are many, many cases of that that I'm not going to go into now. And it maintains the integrity of the gut mucosa and regulates its permeability and turnover, playing a major role in gut pathologies associated with barrier dysfunction. Hundreds of citations tell us what we think and feel affects our gut. Psychological stressors increase small intestinal permeability in a subset of healthy humans with endocrine signs of stress axis activation. So the dig-in mnemonic is used to help you burrow into the function of the gut and have a way of looking at the gut. So let's talk about the role the GI tract plays in many chronic diseases. 
There's nutrient insufficiencies, medications, infectious agents, ethanol, localized free radical production, food allergies, traumatic brain injury, diminished hydrochloric acid secretion, psychological emotional stress, hypoxia, exposure to extreme altitudes. All of these may impact on gut function and contribute to gut dysregulation. Immunologically mediated localized inflammatory responses, breach of mucosal integrity, portal circulation flooded with antigenic macromolecules, resulting in detox pathway stress, and when you cross the line of tolerance, now you get systemic inflammation from that, increase in circulating immune complexes, complexes activation of the complement cascade, chronic inflammation impacting HPA axis. There's a topic called molecular mimicry that you'll find, you'll see in your practice every day when you look for it. Antigens may possess similar antigenic determinants as human tissue. For example, if you go to PubMed and you type in Klebsiella and ankylosing spondylitis, you'll see the studies. If you carry the gene HLA-B27, and if you get a uh, Klebsiella pneumonia infection, very common infection that's gotten in hospitals, you're at risk of developing ankylosing spondylitis. Why? Because the antibodies fighting the Klebsiella are looking for a particular protein structure, that Klebsiella. That sequence protein structure is very similar to the um, collagen in the joints of the spine. So the antibodies going after the Klebsiella can go after the antibodies in your spine, and you develop ankylosing spondylitis. We're all familiar with molecular mimicry, and we may not have thought about it, but why do dentists give antibiotics? Only one reason that I know of, when they're working in your mouth, and they squirt some water and you spit it out and it's red water or pink water, they've given you leaky gums. Leaky gut, leaky gums. And it takes two to three days for those leaky gums to heal. But in the meantime, until they heal, the saliva is full of pathogenic bacteria like strep. And if strep gets in through the leaky gums into the bloodstream, and if it starts to colonize, and your immune system makes antibodies against strep, the signature of the strep that the immune system makes antibodies against is very similar to the valves of your heart. And those antibodies to strep can attack the valves of your heart. That's rheumatic fever. And that'll kill you. That's why dentists give antibiotics is because of molecular mimicry. And the same thing is true with streptococcus, of course, rheumatic heart fever, proteus, and rheumatoid arthritis. It's the same with uh, dairy and MS that you can see studies about molecular mimicry with most autoimmune diseases now. So this is a simple drawing that demonstrates that. You get a leaky gut, you get macromolecules going through, the immune system gets activated. To fight that macromolecule, you make antibodies, and the antibodies attack that antigen, but if there's molecular similar, similarity with the knee joint, as an example, some of the antibodies go after your knee. Here comes rheumatoid arthritis. That's why you always want to look with any autoimmune disease to in, uh, intestinal permeability and then think about molecular mimicry. Is there a contribution here of gasoline on the fire? That's one reason why wheat sensitivity is so common going on gluten-free diets. You'll hear so many of the speakers this week talk about gluten-free diets, and one of the reasons is because of molecular mimicry. So we started with this slide. Now I think you have a little more understanding of some of the mechanisms of how that can work. So what about stool analysis as a foundational tool to help evaluate gastrointestinal function? Using a stool analysis as a pattern recognition tool. That's the purpose of stool analysis, is look for patterns. The complexity of the interlaced web-like connections within the metabolome are complex leaving a one analyte, one problem interpretation problematic. It's not often that you want to do that. Now, everyone loves labs. Everyone does. But you need to ask some hard questions of your labs. Uh, sometimes it shows us patterns, like shadows on the wall. Sometimes it shows us a piece of the puzzle. Using a stool analysis as a pattern recognition tool is pieces of the puzzle in which recognition of overall patterns is important. So we're looking for patterns when we do stool analysis. Digestive and absorptive markers, immune inflammatory markers, gut microbiome metabolic products, 
So first, the digestive and absorptive markers. So the first one we're going to look at here is pancreatic elastase. Pancreatic elastase, which many labs do, is looking for function of the pancreas, secreting some of their digestive enzymes. It's secreted exclusively by the human pancreas. It reflects overall enzyme production. It's not affected if a patient's taking enzymes so that you can do this test on them. And it's highly sensitive and highly specific. Here are some of the markers for it. If it's uh, above 350, you've got normal function. It can be used for initial determination of pancreatic insufficiency and to monitor function in patients under treatment. Patients in whom testing may be useful include unexplained diarrhea, weight loss, other signs of malabsorption, abdominal pain. We have handouts for you on HCL insufficiencies and deficiencies and bile insufficiencies and deficiencies. For pancreatic, we don't quite have the same kind of handouts for you. That's why pancreatic elastase and some of the other markers like putrefactive short-chain fatty acids are really good to use. Products of protein breakdowns, the putrefactive short-chain fatty acids. When that's out of balance, hypochlorhydria is a very common cause of that, not enough hydrochloric acid. Low secretion of protein digesting enzymes by the pancreas. Poor absorption of protein. If you've got inflammation in your gut, you may not absorb very well. And dysbiosis, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These are some of the consequences of low hydrochloric acid. Once again, Dr. Wright's book, um, uh, The Many Benefits of Hydrochloric Acid, is an excellent little book to read. What about fecal fats? Well, you certainly want to test for fecal fats. And some companies simply look at a fat stain, which is a similar marker of fat digestion and absorption. Immune and inflammatory markers, local inflammatory metabolites, immune markers. Calprotectin is an excellent one to use. It's found in the cytosol of the neutrophil. Uh, it has bacteriostatic activity when it's elevated. It's elevated in inflammatory bowel disease, post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, a number of other conditions that you can see there. And this is the real takeaway with calprotectin. A person with positive Rome criteria but a normal calprotectin, less than 50, has no chance of, in, of having inflammatory bowel disease. It's irritable bowel syndrome. No chance of inflammatory bowel disease. Lactoferrin, another marker. Uh, inflammatory marker that you may see is, um, while not quite as much literature on it, it's often seen in synonymous ways to calprotectin. Uh, eosinophilic protein X, here's another marker that you look uh, as a marker of inflammation in the gut. It's a sensitive marker of GI inflammation. Secretory IgA, I mentioned earlier, if you've got a low secretory IgA, that patient is vulnerable to having an inflammatory cascade and be more sensitive to having dysbiosis in their gut because they've lost their introductory primary protective mechanism to bind onto antigens that have been swallowed and they can't be escorted out so those antigens stick around in the gut. It's a predominant immunoglobulin released onto the surface of the GI mucosa and it binds, as I mentioned, uh, in the lumen on any antigens that it may come across. The microbiome and its metabolic products looks for bugs, bacteria, fungal, protozoal. It can look at action, depending on what lab you're using, and it looks at metabolic products, short-chain fatty acids, beta-glucuronidase, secondary bile acids, and pH. We use these tests every day in practice. They're basic go-to tests to give an overview of what's going on in the gut. You can identify protozoa, worms, bacteria, yeast. When you're looking for parasites, there are a number of different methods depending on what lab you're using. Ovum parasites, enzyme uh, uh, searching for worms and protozoa is generally done in two ways. You can do ova and parasites or enzyme amino assays looking for Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Tamoeba histolytica. Detection rates are a function of a number of factors. One of the things that we look at, I've always asked the question, how can one inch of stool out of 25 feet of intestines be comprehensive when you're doing a stool analysis? It can't. 
be. It's a helpful tool to give you some suggestions, but it can't be comprehensive. So what we've done in practice, we always have our patients induce diarrhea, kind of shake things up in there a little bit. And the detection rate goes up when you do that. I send patients to the pharmacy. Ask your pharmacist, say your doctor wants a purged stool sample, and ask them what you should use. Let your pharmacist decide what that should be. So in the microbiome, the bacteria and yeast can be looked for. Dysbiosis, we've talked about dysbiosis. It's the overgrowth of microorganisms of low intrinsic virulence, but that alter nutritional status, immune response, elimination capacity of the host. The standard American diet, low in fiber, high in fat and simple carbs, broad spectrum antibiotics, chronic maldigestion, especially after using PPIs, chronic constipation, not enough of the probiotic bacteria, and too much stress causing increased catecholamines. They all can have an impact on your microbiome, and laboratories will culture to see what might be in your microbiome. They'll take a number of Petri dishes, they put your sample in the Petri dishes, put your name on it, let it sit on a shelf for a number of days and see what grows in there. This is one type of report that you'll see of beneficial bacteria, additional bacteria. You'll see here that uh, in the middle, the Klebsiella pneumoniae had three pluses in the yellow zone. But I have that one inch of stool, 25 feet of intestine consciousness. If they've got Klebsiella pneumonia identified at any level, I'm going to address it. That's my clinical decision to make because it's a pathogen. It doesn't have any benefits in the body that I know of. But it's great to have these kinds of tests to help us find out a general idea of what's in the gut. And bacteriology cultures, we're looking for the beneficial bacteria that should be there commensals, and are there any dysbiotic flora? 16S RNA is a uh, more current uh, platform of evaluating the microbiome. It can only identify bacteria to the genus level, though. So what we're looking for in these types of tests is diversity of the microbiome. Do we have enough of a big picture of the microbiome? One of the things I recommend to all of my patients when they've got dysbiosis of any type, there's two things. One, Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping for vegetables, always buy organic, but buy every root vegetable that's there. Rutabagas, turnips, parsnips, carrots, sweet potatoes, radishes, every one. And every day you have at least one root vegetable because the fiber feeds the probiotics in the gut. And then go to that great library in the sky, Google and type in list of prebiotic foods and print out the list, put it on your refrigerator and have two of those every day. Banana is a prebiotic feeding the good bacteria. Artichokes are a prebiotic feeding the good bacteria. So every day you have one root vegetable and two from the list to help feed the good bacteria in your gut. We want the diversity. That's the critical component is the diversity. Another lab will show you this kind of a visual of the total picture of the sample that you send in. Short-chain fatty acids, beta-glucuronidase, secondary bile acids, pH, we also look at those. So what is it about um, the metabolic factors in a stool analysis? Let's take butyrate as an example. Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. The fastest growing cells in the body are the inside lining of the gut. Every two to three days, you have a whole new lining of the gut. How is that done? Those cells on the epithelial lining of the gut use the short-chain fatty acid called butyrate as the fuel to build new cells. And if you don't have enough butyrate, you build your house out of straw instead of brick. And the patient just looks at you and say, just go on Google and type in butyrate, and I spell the word out for them, butyrate and colon cancer. And they do, oh my God. So you want high butyrate. And how do you get high butyrate? It's the action of vegetable fiber by the good bacteria in your gut that makes more butyrate or butyric acid. So eat your vegetables every day. Okay, okay. They get it. They understand why they need more vegetables to produce the short-chain fatty acids that are beneficial to produce healthier, younger cells in your gut. 
So the beneficial short chain fatty acids. There's the butyrate and the total short chain fatty acids, critically important in creating an environment to build healthy, strong lining to your gut. Here's a summary slide on butyrate. You can see all of the contributions that uh, adequate levels of butyrate can make. Studies show about weight control and satiety. Other studies on insulin sensitivity, helping to um, increase insulin sensitivity, reduce insulin resistance when you have adequate levels of butyrate. I mean, the list goes on and on of its benefits. And you get plenty of butyrate when you eat enough vegetable fiber. So one root vegetable a day, two from the list of prebiotics, and then the rainbow diet of vegetables. So this is what some of the uh, reports will look like. What about beta-glucuronidase? Well, one of the most important things I remember about beta-glucuronidase, if it's elevated, it takes the remnants of used-up estrogens and glues them back together again and get reabsorbed. And just look at high beta-glucuronidase levels and hormone-related cancers. So you don't want elevated beta-glucuronidase levels. That's why it's checked here, is that it's fairly common. In my practice, you would see one out of six, one out of eight women that will have elevated beta-glucuronidase levels. And you never know to address it unless you know it's there. And looking at some of the secondary bile acids is always useful to give you a sense of gallbladder function and how your body's doing with breaking down fats. That's the dig-in mnemonic. Let's evaluate the stool analysis on Joan, and what dysfunction may be present. Is there evidence of impaired digestion, evidence of dysbiosis, evidence of increased permeability? Okay, let's do that now. So a summary of Joan's stool analysis. Isn't it exciting to see, when, when you look at these kind of test results now with her history, you get an idea of what, what what the mechanism might be that's been going on for her. So potentially impaired digestive function, yes, yeah, she's got reduced pancreatic elastase. We might consider pancreatic enzymes for her. Evidence of dysbiosis, yes, presence of opportunistic organisms, blastocystis, redu reduced diversity, low N-butyric acid, low butyrate. Yes, we want to build a healthier microbiome for her, however you're going to do that. Possibility of increased permeability? Yes, well, the tests weren't done for permeability, but there's enough evidence here that suggests there's a pattern that would make you suspicious to look a little further into that. So as a summary, a healthy gut has proper nutritional substrates, micronutrients, phytonutrients for maintenance of commensal flora, critically important, the commensal flora, that has adequate immune modulation repair and regeneration, proper mastication, try the chewing exercise, just one forkful, chew it 30 times, count 30 times, and just notice the difference. Adequate digestive juices, enzymes, and pH, look in your handouts, you've got, in your toolkit, you've got some great handouts that'll help you think about, uh, uh, do I need to address digestive enzyme function with this person? Consider intestinal epithelial barrier function, Create a uh, balanced microbiome for autonomic balance. An imbalanced sick gut looks like poor diet, dehydration, interaction of medications, infections, toxins, inadequate digestive enzymes and stomach acid, imbalanced ecology, impaired intestinal permeability, altered neuroendocrine balance and autonomic function. There's a whole lot here to learn. You know, you're not going to walk out on Monday morning and be an expert at this. This is going to take a little while. It's okay. One of my first mentors said, take one patient file home with you a night. Just take 10 minutes and review that file. Now, be conscious of HIPAA guidelines and all that, but just review one patient file a night. Take 10 minutes. What would I do differently from a functional medicine perspective on that patient? And if you do that one patient a night or one patient a week, it won't be long before you're catching some of these signs when you're first seeing them in office. It's by repetition that you really dial this down. And Dr. Sid Baker, I think, was associated with this mnemonic. This was the basics of functional medicine. Put the good guys in, take the bad guys out. 
you know, and your patients will be happy and will get well. The GI system is an integral central node of the complex web of functional medicine. Dysregulation of the GI system has a profound impact on every aspect of health. Our patients are best served if we observe the interrelationships between digestion and absorption, intestinal permeability, the microbiota, immune modulation and inflammation, and the enteric nervous system. We started with this slide, all disease begins in the gut. Obtain a comprehensive history, do a comprehensive physical exam, create a detailed timeline, consider additional tests to rule in, out current diagnosis the patient carries, populate your matrices with each patient. As you can see, there's quite a bit to this that you're going to be learning more about. The practice of medicine is the practice of uncertainty, right? You take all the pieces of the puzzle and take your best clinical experience to determine how am I going to begin with this patient. And with that, I would say thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you.